Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson and welcome back to the MTV Spider-Man Retrospectives. And today, we're going to be discussing episode 12 of Spider-Man, the new animated series, Mind Games Part 1. Now, for those wondering why I'm looking at Part 1 and not Part 2 of this of this, of this this story, it's because when it comes to multi-parter stories in these vlogs, I typically look at one part per week, as I would any other regular episode. While I will typically sum up my thoughts on, on, all the, on the entire story when I get through all the parts... Usually, I just I also like to give my thoughts on each individual episode and what, what I think worked and how I think it builds up. So, but that so but any who wanted to meet who are disappointed that I'm not looking at parts one and two, apologies, but that is what it is. But with that being said, for today's episode, we're introduced to a new pair of villains. In this case, a set of twins called the Gaines twins, a brother and sister duo who have a who have immense mental powers and psychic abilities, and and unfor who unfortunately are kind of a problem. You see, they were actually. You see, they were a bit of a nuisance, to put it nicely, at the previous prison, as their as the containment devices that were being used to well keep them contained kept shorting out. And during one particular attempt, and during one of those particular blackouts, they took control of the minds of one of their guards and got and you and descent and had him torture one of his fellow guards to death, while another just kind of balled up in a corner and cried. As such, one as such, they're being moved to a more secure facility that'll hopefully be able to contain them. And in the intermediate time, they have the pair drugged and locked up in a special, in a special little I want to say case or cell or whatever and so, until they get there. Unfortunately, though, the twins are not without their resources. As it's as while they're being transported, the truck they're on is attacked by I'm guess I'm just gonna say one of their henchmen who ends up. Who the impact of it manages to ju manages to jostle the drugs that were being used to keep them in line from their well from their prison outfits and because of this it allows them to gain control of one of the guards of the truck they're in have him shoot the driver and take control of the truck him and and ultimately cause and cause a distraction while they get while they go into their the truck that their henchmen had and drive away as such with all the mayhem that the truck that the that the guard is causing inside the armored truck that winds up getting the attention of Spider-Man, who manages to get him off the road and 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 free him from the Gaines twins' control. But of course, and of, but of course, he also goes after the Gaines twins' vehicle as well as they were as they were both in tandem with each other. However, upon Spider-Man getting into the vehicle, the Gaines twins immediately try whammying him and get into his head as he begins like struggling and groaning while you see the while you can hear the twins' voices in his head. But Spider-Man seems to have enough mental fa mental fortitude to fight back and get and well get their tubes into and jab them into their legs, causing the twins to causing the twins' powers to dampen enough so that he can get so that they're kind of well so that he can be so that he can take them down. As such, the police arrive and while Spider-Man does warn them that they might just use their mental powers on them, they don't seem to have any episodes as all the police really do is just blindfold them and take them away, which surprises Spider-Man, but he's not complaining, so he just swings away however while the twin how all the twins are seemingly moved to a new facility they do end up causing a bit of a scrap as we all as p as it turns out that when they are moved to the facility they decided to they decided to cause a bit of mayhem as they use their powers to take control of an administrator in the building and through him they're able to set other prisoners free in this case pterodax and silver sable and because of this, and because of that, they're now on the loose in New York, and Spider-Man has to deal with it. And sure enough, the instant, once Peter hears that knowledge, they end up attacking the Science Center, the one that was that was that was gonna be that was gonna get beat, that was gonna get built at the beginning of this series. And so, and of course, so as such, everything's still under construction for it. And so, Spider-Man, of course, goes in and and manages to take Teradax down and save the hot and save the hostages they have. But in the process, one of the one of the signs for the building, a big ESU sign, gets knocked off the building and falls to the and falls to the street below. And while there are no casualties, there is one injury: Harry Osborn, who was there to make sure that all hell didn't break loose, since well, you know, Oscorp was the one funding this thing. Thankfully, that, well, and ultimately, for, thankfully for him though, it's mo it's just a broken arm, but it's still kind of a it's still an injury. Either way, Spider-Man manages to take down Teradax and of course get some good pictures in. But they're still not exact. But everyone's not exactly out. But he's not exactly out of the woods yet. Especially when he, as he, when he brings pictures of his fight with Ter when Spot Peter brings pictures of his Spidey fight with Teradax to Jonah for, to 
be printed in the Bugle, Jonah mentions how there's actually another Spider-Man baddie that's loose in town, Craven the Hunter, which... I'm going to pause this briefly to kind of rant about that. Remember how I said that this show utilized the continuity of the of the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie as the basis for it? Yeah, I don't really know where Craven fits into this. Especially since they do talk about Peter having encountered Craven before. Like, they mention, like, due to conversation, like, apparently, years prior to this episode, Spider Man and Craven wound up fighting, and it resulted in Spider Man defeating him and had him get, and Craven being sent to U a Ukrainian gulag. And as a result, and apparently he stayed there for years thanks to Spider Man. And so, as a result of this, and so as a result, Craven, of course, has a grudge against Spider Man. The problem is, we, the audience, don't know, don't really see this. And, while you may be wondering why I'm making a big deal out of this, since Craven's kind of a classic Spider-Man villain, why exactly? Why, why, like, just why, just why am I making a big deal out of it? Because he wasn't really established, and I don't really see a place where he can fit into the continuity of the show or the movies. Like I said, the show operate is meant to be operating on the continuity of at least the first Sam Raimi film. And while I'm willing to accept that maybe year a few years have passed since the end since when that dirt since that movie and this since the beginning of that movie and this one was there a time a period in, in, even in the first sam raimi spider-man film when peter could have clashed with craven the hunter i mean it's possible but the but based on dialogue in this episode it means craven's had at least a quite a bit of time to fester and grow have and have a healthy hate or have an unhealthy hatred with spider-man and that's not really built up in maybe two years. That has, it may be, and that's not really built up with in maybe a couple years. I think me, he says he spent years in there, which I guess a couple years would work. But still, I, I still don't really see a place where Craven the Hunter would fit in to that continuity, especially since in the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, the first major supervillain Spidey fought was the Green Goblin. So to be fair, Crazy Game Hunter might not really qualify as a supervillain, but don't quote me on that, but whatever. I just think it's kind of weird that they're bringing in Craven without really a proper introduction, and, and especially since he seems to have prior history with Spider-Man that we don't see. So I'm going to dock the, epi the episode. I'm going to dock the episode some points for that. But bottom line, he's back in town, and obviously he wants revenge. Jonah offers Peter a job to... Jen Jonah wants Peter to get pictures of it, obviously. However, after me after having this meeting, it turns guess who's waiting outside but Craven the Hunter and Silver Sable, who it turns out are working together and are tracking Peter because he's apparent because they know he's clearly tied to Spider Man. Well, him and his friends. Thankfully, Peter's spider sense alerts him to Silver Sable and Craven's presence, and as such, it allows him to make a getaway. And of course, they chase after. And before when they catch up, he's already changed into his Spidey jammies and is ready to fight them both. And while he does. And while he's able to, uh, while he's able to apprehend Silver Sable, Craven ultimately makes a getaway, and before Spider-Man can pursue, the police arrive. So he and Craven just kind of is, and so Craven already is gone. However, Silver Sable does let out some final words before she's arrested again, or arrested, I mean, as she says that there are other ways to get revenge. As apparently, while they talk, she mentioned how there are other ways to get revenge on Spider-Man, and that no, and that does end up kind of hitting Peter. You see. Uh, uh, which is where one of the other major aspects of this episode kind of occurs. You see, in the episode, Peter is starting to kind of come to turn. Is starting to really have to. Is starting to have to really think about where he is when it comes to relationships and so forth. As he's as he's been spending a lot more time with Indy because of their well, I'm just gonna say relation their relationship, which has clearly become romantic in the last few episodes. But it's all. But also in the episode, it's clear that he still has some feelings for MJ. Especially since after he apprehended the Gaines twins, he was he MJ and Spider Man, not Peter, Spider Man, were kind of having a date. And even that, and even in a civilian identity, Peter was sp still still spending quite a bit of time with MJ. So there's still some feelings festering under there. So and as and of course, even MJ and Indy can note and seem to notice this as they end up having a talk, and they both make it clear to Peter he's got to pick someone. He can't just be he can't just play the field, so to speak. Which again, I don't really know if he was playing the field because I, because he and MJ did seem to have a designated breakup, and Peter and it, Peter made it no secret that he was kind of seeing Indy. But whatever, it makes it clear that they want. It makes it clear that, they, that MJ and Indy want Peter to pick one of them, and well, 
Spot Peter's starting to realize that maybe there is someone he wants to be with. As after his encounter with Silver Sable, Peter ends up find ends up finding MJ while she's out, just kind of wandering around, and just kind of talks with her and says that how and talk and tell and like, he's doing this as Spider Man. He's telling her how he how worried he is about her, about her about her friends, about P, about her friends and everything he pulls them into. And MJ mentions how, yeah, you seem to be a bit of a, pro you, got, you seem to be a trouble magnet. Maybe it would be better if I avoided you and Peter. And Spider-Man mentions, or maybe you just have to deal with one of us. And while, and MJ of course is confused, but you can see Spider-Man just kind of mulling something over before he grabs MJ by the arm and pulls her into an alley. And so once they're alone, MJ of course is asking what's going on. And Peter says, I think, I, and Pete, and so spider-man looks to mj and he unmasks revealing to her that he's peter parker and mj takes it surprisingly well like too well like she's a little surprised of course but at best she's like oh my god you're spider-man well wow, oh my god you can't, I can't believe you trust me with this secret oh this changes everything it's like it's like Peter's actually okay, is happy that she now knows, but she does seem to be taking the new the news a little too well. And immediately after, she Peter pulls her in for a kiss, so everything seems okay. But their little sweet moment is interrupted by Craven the Hunter, who's in the, who apparently was just kind of hiding in a doorway or something because that's where he steps out, and he's got a and he's got like a ah, frack. I forgot what it was called. A cross, and he's got a crossbow that's armed with poison darts in, in it. As such, MJ, as such, Peter, to, uh, Spidey tells MJ to make a run for it, and he and he'll deal with Craven. But before they can actually, th before he can actually throw a punch, Craven manages to catch MJ, whose big priority was just to you know hide behind a dumpster. And and and, and Spidey, and when and so he takes MJ, and Spidey says, "Okay, okay, look, I'll do whatever you want. Just don't hurt her." And Craven's response is, what I want is to make you suffer. Before he takes a poison-tipped dart and jabs it right into MJ's neck. As such, he just drops her body. And as such, Craven drops MJ's body and just runs for it. In the meantime, Spider-Man goes in and picks up MJ as she's, as she's just kind of lying there, the, the life leaving her. And Peter's just saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. But MJ tells him, Peter, I'm so happy. Before the color literally just fades from her face and she dies in his arms. From there, the episode cuts ahead to the cemetery where Peter and Peter and Harry, now sporting a, a cast, are standing over MJ's grave. And after and P uh, Harry tells Sp Peter, now you know why I hate Spider Man. And Peter just kind of wanders off, and he's not doing well. He's just kind of like holding on to let. He's just kind of holding on to a, a railing around the cemetery, a stone railing at that. And it looks like he's trying to maintain his composure. He's trying to keep it inside, but he's not doing a good job. As at one point, as he while he tries to stop himself from like crushing a spider in anger. It ends up causing an even bigger blowout as he takes the cinder block of the spider's on and then just chucks it right into the sea. Uh, however, this action was not unnoticed. Specifically, this is where we get a Stan Lee cameo for this series. He plays the role of the keeper of the cemetery. And he is a little... And his reactions aren't of someone who is shocked to learn that one of the people visiting his gravesite, uh, the gravesite, is Spider-Man. His reaction is interesting. He begins talking about how tragic it is that MJ is dead and Craven just just kind of wandered off, and that nothing Peter could do could bring her back. Can bring her back. How angry he must be feeling. And of course, Peter just tries blowing him off. But one thing that gets very interesting about about Mister Lee here is how he is very, very interesting is a very is a, is a certain line he says. It's like, but wouldn't that anger you feel be better channeled into revenge? This gets Peter's attention somewhat. While he's still a little apprehensive, he wants to like 
he begins wondering, who are you? But Mr. Lee doesn't answer his questions, instead continuing to go to Mon saying, you, it's like, he, it's like, how does it, how did it feel holding her in your arms while Craven just, just wandered off? Does, how, does that get to you? Does that make you angry? And this begins inciting more of Peter's rage as he talks about how he want, how if he had the chance, he would kill Craven with his bare hands. And as he wa and as he walks, and so he takes a few more steps towards the get, towards the keeper of the grave step of the graveside, and he asks, "Would you? It's like, would you be willing to? It's like, what would you be willing to give up? To would you be willing to give? What would you be willing to give up to get revenge?" And he says, anything. I would give anything. And he says, are you sure? Peter says, yes. And then he says, his voice shifting slightly, are you sure you're sure? Peter says, yes. I want revenge. And it's then we learn what's really going on. You see... Remember when I mentioned how the Gaines twins tried to whammy Spider-Man at the beginning of the episode and failed? That was a load. They actually succeeded. It turns out that from that point on, this entire episode was a Lotus Eater trap. A fake world that the, that the twins implanted into Spider-Man's head in order to get him to a point where he would want to kill Kraven. And the entire time that he's been out, and the entire time, the entire episode that we've been seeing is really just Spot P Spider Man's dream as the, as the twins are the twins are feeding into his mind, and as a result of this, and as and with Peter's little statement, they believe he's ready. Now you may be wondering why exactly do the twins want Craven dead? Well, this kind of feeds into their backstory. You see, the the twins gained their psychic powers because the KGB apparently, well, the K the KGB wound up exper wound up experimenting on their parents, and as a result of this, their parents are dead. But uh, as a result of those experiments, the twins wound up gaining these immense psychic powers, which they can, which they are, which they're okay with. They like using them. But of course, when your parents are killed by the Russian Secret Service, you kind of tend to hold a grudge. And wouldn't you know it, it turns out Sergei Kravinov was one of the people behind that experiment. So naturally, they kind of want his head on a pike. And so, and so, of course, and so as a result, this entire plan, the breakout, the whammying, putting Peter all into this, it was to get him to this point so they could sick him on Craven the Hunter and, and thus get their revenge. And as such, as the, tw as the twins are contemplating this, Spider-Man wakes up and they sit and they tell him that, that Craven is by the waterfront and that he should, and that Pete and that Spidey needs to go there and avenge MJ's death. And so with that last mental command, Spider-Man leaves. And so the twins end up going, and so the twins meet up with their henchmen and the real Stanley. Okay, not the real Stanley. I mean the one in this universe who is this one in this universe. And they tell him that his work is done. He can leave. That he shouldn't. That he shouldn't run into them again. And they. And then the twins and their henchmen go into the back room. And sure enough, while Spider Man was knocked out, they did. They had the twins had the henchmen grab MJ because well they need because they need Spider Man needs to think she's dead. And in just in case thing, and if they want, if they need to actually kill her in order to keep the fantasy going, they really don't have an issue with that. And so the episode ends with Peter swinging off, with Spider-Man swinging off through New York, thoughts of revenge in his head, and ultimately a sense of dread, a sense of dread coming as you wonder what will happen next. So, yeah, overall, first part, I think it's pretty good. I like I th what I do. I, well, it, there are some minor problems I do have with it. First and foremost, again, Craven the Hunter. Again, if, if this show is meant to still, like I said when I talked about when I when the episode introduced him, I still don't really understand where he fits into the continuity of the show or the movie. There's not. I don't really see. I don't really see a lot of time for when Spider Man could have you know fought Craven the Hunter and then for him to spend years in a gulag only for him to escape. Like, I don't really see where that could have fit into the continuity of this show or the original movie. You can maybe make the argument that maybe he fought him early in his career and then he spent, like, maybe a couple of years in the gulag, but 
the way he talks, it makes it it kind of seems to imply that there was a longer time. So, yeah, it doesn't really I don't really see how it all fits together. So I'm gonna consider that a problem. And I guess another minor flaw would probably be the MJ's reaction to Spider Man. Though to be fair, considering that her reaction was actually in a dream world, and the twins were trying to get to make Peter have an even greater sense of urgency to want to get revenge on Craven. Uh, you could probably you could probably let it slide, especially since they probably were trying to keep they're trying to keep Peter happy, only to take him that happiness away with Craven killing him with Craven killing MJ. So I'm gonna so that's kind of a, I'll let that one slide for now. But as for the rest of the episode, I think it's really good. I think it's still I think it's really good. It definitely is not it's like not, it's not fantastic, but it is still pretty nice and it's still really good to see. Especially in regards to where, okay, actually, you know what? I'll give us another flaw. The stuff with the relationships and Peter double dipping, so to speak, with Indy and MJ. Especially since previous episodes have established that Peter, that while there are still some ex, there's some still some tension between Peter and MJ. It's clear he is trying to move on as he is as he is actively dating Indy while still trying to see MJ as just a friend. So I'll give that one as a flaw, though. To be fair, if Peter. If, be fair, if Sp if Peter is still seeing MJ as Spider Man, maybe he did kind of. I think he probably should have gotten that reality check. Well, that. But anyway, as for the rest of the episode, I think it's still really good. I do like. I do kind of like how it feels like a bit of a. How it feels like it's kind of going back over stuff from previous episodes, especially since this is the first part of the series finale. When so as a result, it is kind of cool seeing these previous villains that can make a reappearance actually actively do. Of course, not all villains make a comeback. It's just a handful. Like I said, it's just Teradax and Silver Sable, but we do get some more little quick cameos of other and references to other other stuff throughout the series, like the the science center for ESU being built. I like I liked a little bit of that. I like talk I like seeing more of in seeing more with Indy as we do see her talking more and her kind of ranting about a scoop she missed which again it's yeah in the fantasy world but still that does really that was nice the interactions are still fun fun and it does and again I do kind of and one aspect I do like how they hint at the at the fact at the lotus eater world because throughout the episode at, throughout the episode there are actually there are little moments where you see spider-man seemingly flashing back to when he was getting whammy by the twins and it just keeps popping back every now and then at moments that feel a little strange like it's clear that there's something off going on and that's a tone that's 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 constantly throughout the episode especially with especially when scenes that where people should be shocked or angry they're taking things a little too well well like let's go use an example in the scene where Peter brought J. Jonah Jameson pictures of him, of him fighting Teradax, Jonah was a bit more jovial about the pictures. Normally, Jonah would call all the pictures crap and then immediately start negotiating a check for Peter. Whereas here, he actually thinks all these look fantastic. That Peter really knocked it out of the park this time around. How they're really going to outsell all the other papers. They're going to spread them out, yada, yada, yada. Jonah, even if he liked the pictures, would not be this jovial. So it's there's something really going on there, especially when he keeps singing Peter's praises, which is not a Jonah thing to do. Even in this show, the few times we've seen Jonah, it's always him trying to negotiate. It's him trying to negotiate with Peter to get a lower rate and constantly giving him crap for it. So it's. Yeah, there's a little something there. And again, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, the stuff with MJ, the stuff, how she seems to take Spider-Man revealing his secret a little too well. It's kind of a, like it does still hint that there is something off going on, that something fe that things feel a little too right. And even the, even the even having all the villains come out feels a little too too convenient, especially when the Gain Twins don't put up much of a fight when Spider-Man initially fought them. And of course, when P when Peter learns about how the Gain Twins breaking out Teradax and Silver Sable, he learned it from Indy. He does naturally ask the question, "Well, what happened?" It's like, "Wait, how did he do that?" It's like, "Oh, they used their weird mind powers," which is kind of odd, especially considering that they are being transferred to this new prison because it had better facilities to contain the twins with. So it definitely, so they do lay enough hints to make you wonder, ex to make you think that there's something clearly off going on they do leave enough so that you can to at least lull you into thinking that this that this thing is real as apparently as 
like that like during the fantasy we actually do cut to Sil to Silver Sable and Craven like on a building spying on Peter like when he's like down down on the street uh, and across from them which they're having a conversation which I don't know if the twins would go that far to have to actually make it feel real which I think is kind of weird but whatever that's a minor detail in the grand scheme of things but it is enough that, but it is enough there to tr at least trick the audience into thinking that maybe this is real so I'll give you that I do I'll give you that one Though to be fair, they might have had a trick Peter Spider Sense, which that's actually another weird thing. Why is this, isn't his spider sense going off constantly? I read an issue of Spider Girl where she was trapped in a Lotus Eater world, and her spider sense was going off was going off the rails the entire time she was in there. So wouldn't Peter's be the same? I don't know. I'll get I don't know. That's a th that's just I don't know. That's a personal pit that's a personal nitpick at best. But again, I still like the I still like the little hints at that. And the ending definitely makes you go, what the hell? Especially when you see Spider-Man swinging off into the distance, the twins having MJ captive so they can use her as insurance if things go south. And honestly, a really ep freaky Stan Lee cameo. Because, just imagine it with me. Stan the Man Lee. This super chipper, nice guy who at best feels like the... Who best who who is either this great lovable lovable guy who you just like hanging out with, or just this or just this nice old grandpa who will give you a who will chew chew you out if you think you deserve it, or is ultimately just very or ultimately is the guy always giving you presents. Imagine that, but then imagine him telling you to give in to your anger, your hatred, and seek vengeance. It's kind of creepy. Like this, like the idea of having Stan Lee of all people telling Spider-Man one of the one of the most one of the like this this guy one of the most jokey heroes who's dealt with so much crap who was always constantly told that power and responsibility are the key that even by his very origin learned that vent that you that selfish selfish personal stuff def can de is not a way something you should be using your power for actually telling Peter Parker to seek revenge. And actively give into that hatred, it's kind of a little shocking and kind of a little off-putting. I la and it kind of works for the episode, especially when you see Peter actively questioning him, which does kind of feed into the whole Stanley was the watcher thing. Which I don't care if that was disproven. I don't care. Stanley can be a watcher. There is more than one. So I like that. I genuinely like that and seeing where it and so I genuinely like that. And as a result, the episode I think does well in show in setting up just kind of. The, how where things are going to go for the next for the next episode where things where things will happen having a more angry spider-man who is ready to seek revenge having having him go after craven the hunter ready to kill even the stuff with just even the stuff the, the, the even laying down the groundwork with the twins still having mj and ready to you and ready to kill her if the need arises so I do like that. It does set up a suitable tension, and I'll just also say this: I like the twins. I'll talk. I think I'll talk more about them when it gets to part two. But they're, well, but well, we didn't see a lot of them this episode. But I think they're kind of creepy villains again. I'll, I'll elaborate later. But overall, for the first part of the series finale, this definitely does well in laying the groundwork and getting you invested in where things will go, especially when you learn. And all, well, also set establishing just kind of the creepy atmosphere surrounding the world, the plot, and of course the twins themselves. So. I'll give you that. So overall, solid first part. Some minor issues here and there, but overall, definitely a nice begin. Nice, definitely a nice part. So yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you for watching. I'm Samuel Johnson, and I'll see you next time where we see part two of this. Where we see part two of this particular tale, and finally the end of Spider-Man: The New Animated Series. Hope to see you then, and take care.